I, you know, I have to admit to you all, I did something very stupid last Wednesday night. I watched almost all of the Republican town debate between Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. Ne nearly two hours of this verbal hand-to-hand -hand combat. And you, you gotta wonder how many brain cells I lost along the way listening to people trying to beat one another up to destroy the character of the other person. It was literally an example of a 21st century tribalism at its best. Yeah, tribalism. This is a process of dealing with the world that human beings sometimes have practiced ever since we were out throwing stones at woolly mammoths and each other. Yeah, you know, the fact that it's taking place in the 21st century doesn't make it any better. Listen very long to any, any political speech and eventually somebody's going to call the other guy a fascist. You know? To tell you the truth, tribalism is one of several characteristics of, of fascism. The problem is most people who use the F word don't really know what it means. We even hear a bit of tribalism in today's gospel. When you, when you hear Nathaniel, who was one of the uh, first 12 apostles, is being persuaded by his friend Philip to come and hear Jesus talk. He doesn't want to go. When Nathaniel hears where this new preacher Jesus hometown is, he gives a snarky response. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, that we, we do this kind of thing today. How many times have you said, can anything good come out of Bridgeport? Now that right there is 100% judgmentalism. Tribalism. Why does uh, Nathaniel cop an attitude of, of superiority at this point? Why? Because he needs to. After being at the lowest point in his life, we don't hear about that in this gospel. The oral stories about Nathaniel, the oral stories, tell that he was an architect, a builder. He wanted to build for God. And he was very proud that he had hired, they had hired him to put, build public buildings. The Roman government had hired a Jew to build public buildings. So that was unusual since none of the Roman authorities trusted the Jews. But then a building that he was working on collapsed. And of course, somebody has to be blamed for the trouble. He was fired. He had been faithful to God all his life for what he, he thought God wanted him to do. That is, one day build a beautiful synagogue for God. But that was no longer possible. All alone with no one around, he took his aching heart and sat under a fig tree and called out to God. There was silence. He was crushed, praying to a God that didn't seem to be listening. You know, when we are feeling bad about ourselves, the temptation is to look at people who are different from us, and whether it's origin, it's town of origin, or race, or a dozen other things, and see ourselves as superior to the other. Our anxieties about the way things are happening can make us vulnerable to not owning up to our own faults and our own blindnesses. Fortunately, Philip did take Nathaniel to meet Jesus. And at that very moment, Jesus told him that he already knew him. Because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel realized at that moment there was only one way, one way this could happen. Jesus was the son of God. 
and heard all Nathaniel's prayers. You know, like Nathaniel, we are at our most vulnerable when we are anxious and feeling that nobody cares. And these are the people that are targeted these days by politicians who feel they've been ignored, overlooked. And there's the, they're the ones who they try to bring into their tribe with dictatorial, for dictatorial power. I'm telling you these things today so that you will recognize what you already suspect, that the, in anxious times like these, there are people who will try to draw you into their tribe in order to amass their own power out of you. If Nathaniel had stuck with his prejudices, he would never have met Jesus. Uh, someone trying to manipulate a vulnerable somebody will at first tell them out of fear and anxiety that the other guy the enemy is the real fascist, trying to take away their power. And then once those people that that person joins the tribe, the manipulator actually steals the fearful one's power to see the truth. Lies become real. Information becomes fake news. And people actually start to believe there's such a thing as an alternative truth. They want to sow doubt. They set barriers to learning, especially about the, the person, that other person, the other from the other tribes. They will even drape themselves in the, in the garb of Christianity, even though Jesus never, ever, ever taught from a framework of fear, but from a framework of love and justice. Now, especially recently, you may have seen the word Christo-fascism. The theologian Dorothy Swale coined the term to describe a, a kind of Christianity, as she says, that aligns with the domination of others. It's the, this imposter Christianity not only is anti-democratic, it contradicts the life and teachings of Jesus. Reverend Stephen Van Kuyken is pastor in Columbus, Ohio at the North Congregational Church there. Preached on this a couple of weeks ago. And he says, <clears throat> fascism is authoritarian, a divided us versus them society, a form of minority rule when the branches of government are taken over to serve the minority. It is tribal based on the supremacy, the purity the purity of a tribe, Christian or white. <clears throat> the tribe is marked by nationalism, false patriotism, and militarism. Fascism is a system that needs hatred. It needs hatred. Hatred is the oxygen of Christofascism. So it depends on scapegoats and enemies, racism, victimizing, sexism, and xenophobia. You know, it is an anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, and anti-union movement. And it needs the support of imposter Christianity that provides the hatred for this unholy alliance. Some, as we say, somebody has to be blamed for our troubles. The Christo fascists say, there's one thing that's for sure. We don't want any of that vermin's ideas to end up polluting this purity of our own perfect thoughts. So let's put up every roadblock we can to learning. Now, most of us are aware of the Nazis went all the way to book burning. But here in America, not yet. However, last week I was a reading an article, and I learned that down in Escambia County, Florida, which is right above P Pensacola, uh, 1,600 titles, uh, the school district removed 1,600 titles from their school libraries, including Webster's Dictionary and 
uh, the, I lost it here, Webster's Dictionary and the American Heritage Children's Dictionary because, you know, there was sexual content. What wasn't removed was left on bookshelves that were covered with black paper to protect students from, quote, potentially objectionable or illegal content. It's pretty obvious that the parents who object to books with sexual content haven't opened a Bible and read it all the way, the way through. They would be quite surprised. Other Florida schools require parental permission for a child to read any book, any book. And the librarians there say they've seen students stop reading altogether. These are the effects of the ancient polit uh, politics of fear. People who believe that somebody has to be blamed for our troubles often end up hurting vulner vulnerable people, vulnerable, vulnerable people the most. Vulnerable people like children. You know, last week was Epiphany and we still have our manger scene up with our kings. And it was a time that the wise men came to Jerusalem following the star and looking, went to the court of King Herod to see if he knew where the, the newborn king of the Jews was born. So what did King Herod do to counteract this baby king? He ordered the slaughter of all children below the age of two in his entire kingdom. Herod is an example of one of the political leaders, and you run into them during his, in the course of history, who have named themselves the chosen one. And it can be very dangerous because they will try to unite the people they've stolen against a common, common enemy. And that common, common enemy, enemy, depending on the state of their delusion, that despised other could be blacks, whites, Jews, Muslims, gays, straights, handicapped, Democrat, Republican, you get the drill. Whoever and wherever, wherever, whoever and wherever they are, fear, fear, says they need to be defeated for the sake of the false chosen one. The false chosen one says they need to be, to be scapegoated, scapegoated into oblivion. You know, perhaps you remember the origin of that word scapegoat. Back when Moses was lead, leading the Israelites through the desert, there were a lot of sufferings taking place, and Aaron, his brother, decided that that was the cause. Their sins had done that. So what he did in, instead is he took, because people in that, that day believed that the desert was full of demons, they took an innocent goat and they tied a red ribbon to his horn to represent the sins of the people. And that poor animal was sent out into the desert to die a miserable death. While the people actually believed their sins died with that animal. No responsibility, scapegoat. But we, believe in and follow the only chosen one ever sent by God, Jesus. We choose love over fear. The most important thing we can do, most important, is not to declare we are Christians, but to, that we choose to live every day like Jesus by looking for opportunities to love and to serve. Following Jesus doesn't mean we deserve an easy halo because we believe. It means accepting the cross of confronting people who will try to plant hatred. Following Jesus is not an easy path, but it's the only path where we can someday achieve peace and unity. Amen. Thank you.